Hi history friends, Mr. Sherman here. Today we're going to talk a little bit about capitalism, uh, the history of it, uh, what it is, uh, how it impacts you today. And to start off I want to give you a neat little definition. Uh, capitalism is a social and economic system where both the means of production and any associated trade are privately owned. All right. We need to go back, way back in history, biblical times. Let's talk a little bit about Passover. Jesus went to the temple and he got angry because he saw money changers there and he drove them out. Interesting. That is going to impact the way early people thought about money whether it was good, whether it was evil, whether money was a gift from God, stuff like that. So it's kind of interesting. But eventually what's going to happen in about 1450, a book is going to come out called Summa Mathematica. And what it did is it basically stated that money doesn't come from God. It's not like a gift from God and stuff like that. It was actually a science. And if you understood the science, you could make money. What it really did is it created a double entry bookkeeping type of a thing. Basically, the left side, which we can hear for you, the left side is uh, for your debits and your right side is going to be for your credits. And it's we kind of do something similar to that today. So you know exactly the money's coming in and the money's going out. All right. The next thing that's going to make a big difference is about a hundred years later, John Calvin is going to start talking about money and things like that. He's going to talk about something that came to be called the Protestant work ethic. Things like uh, duty and hard work and honesty. And that is really going to impact the formation of the United States, the Protestant work ethic, the idea that you should work really hard because otherwise you'll do things with your hands that you probably shouldn't be doing. All right. Fast forward again to 1776, and I'm not talking about the American Revolution, this is actually Adam Smith and his inquiry into the causes of the wealth of nations. And what Adam Smith is going to do is he is going to turn the world upside down. Prior to Smith's writing, we didn't really have any capitalism. We were working on something called mercantilism. Basically, in mercantilism, you have a powerful king, and that king's job is to make money. And you make money at the expense of other peoples and nations by creating colonies, amassing wealth from those colonies, not only by taking their natural resources, but then using those colonies as a uh, purchaser for your finished goods. And you create a navy and an army to support a company that you have basically created or supported, like the uh, East India Company. And what's going to happen is that company is going to have a monopoly on trade. No one else is going to be able to break in on this monopoly, and if you happen to be in the colonies, it's not an incredibly pleasant experience. America. All right. Adam Smith is going to come up with these some different ideas, and eventually capitalism is going to come from this. And he comes up with some really neat things. Number one, he believed that slavery was absolutely inefficient. It costs too much to procure slaves, it costs too much to keep them around, and they're not going to be extremely effective workers because you're not giving them incentive apart from not getting hurt. And the true incentive is actually to give someone a wage or money, and they'll work harder for you. Next, he talked about a division of labor, kind of like how, and he talked about pins, but if you... Uh, had one person whose job was solely to make a pin, they could make a pin and they could produce a number of them. However, if one person was in charge of uh, getting the metal, one person was in charge of bending it the proper way, and one person was in charge of sharpening it, whatever, you could produce dramatically more. It eventually becomes the assembly line. And uh, this is kind of a neat deal. You know, each person has one little role, one, they're a cog in the machine. Uh, also, he had this idea of the invisible hand. And one of the neat parts about the invisible hand is that capitalists 
by the very nature of making a profit and hiring people are actually helping people as a byproduct of what they're doing. And so there's nothing wrong with capitalism. Capitalism is a really neat idea. You have to somehow have money, capital, in order to have an idea and fund it in order to produce something. And while you're producing it, you then have to hire people. And those people that you've hired are getting wages. And it's bringing them up also. So you, as a capitalist, are making a profit and your workers are, right, their standard of living is raising. Neat. All right. Here's the deal, though. There can occasionally be problems. For instance, in the 1850s or so, you're going to see uh, some issues in Great Britain in particular. Charles Dickens is going to write about this in Hard Times. And what you're going to see is things like inequality. You're going to see child labor. You're going to see problems with the environment and the idea that the producers, like the workers, are being exploited. And what you end up with is someone saying, Please, sir, I want some more. Okay. That's what happens. Possibly. Let's talk a little bit about how capitalism can impact you. All right, let me tell you a little bit about the American dream, capitalism. There's nothing wrong with capitalism, and I admit I have a bias toward capitalism simply because it's the system that I grew up with. I kind of like it. But here's the deal. I'm going to tell you how capitalism can be absolutely amazing. Then we'll talk about sometimes there may be a few problems. For instance, let me give you the beautiful American dream, all right? I like to make amazing bicycles, let's pretend. And I create these bicycles in my garage and I come up with a really neat new way of making a bike that's more efficient, it's faster, it's really cool. People are gonna love it. If I want to continue producing that bike, I'm gonna need capital or I'm gonna need some money. And so what I can do is I can go to my friends or something like that, and if I do that, I can say, hey, I'll give you 10% of my profits if you give me money now. And they kind of become like stockholders. That's a possibility. Normally what you do is this. You borrow money from the bank. No worries. So what I do is I go to a bank. The bank loans me money. They're going to get interest on it because they're allowing me to have the money. Now I have to pay them for that. So what I do is I build a factory with that money. And then I hire a bunch of people. I start to produce bikes. Now, if I produce bikes efficiently and if I make, I, I, if I make them so people like them and if they're cost-effective for people to buy. I make something, it's a good product, and it's relatively inexpensive, and people like it. I'm going to make a profit. And what happens is, let's just say this is what occurs. I make these bikes, I pay my workers very simply, and then people buy my bike. If I make a profit, what I do with that profit is I give it to the, some of it to the bank because I owe them money. The bank is happy, I'm happy, I'm making a profit. Now, one of the interesting things that even John Calvin said way back in the 1500s, he said that if a person makes a profit, this is also part of the Protestant work ethic, if you make a profit, any excess profit that you don't need should go back into your company or your industry or whatever it is that you're doing because that makes God smile. Well, here's the deal. I'm a capitalist. I'm going to make God smile. So what I do is this. I reinvest in my company. I hire more workers. And I'm going to give those workers a good wage. In fact, I'll give them health care. I'll give them all sorts of stuff. I'm going to pay them a lot. The reason I'm going to pay them a lot is I can retain them. If I can pay them enough, they're happy, they stay with me, I don't have to worry about them going somewhere else and working for 
a the, the competition. Also, I don't have to retrain. That's expensive. So they stay with me. Also, they're going to purchase my product. They're all going to go out and buy bikes. And they'll be our bikes. And so it helps. Now, because I've been paying them a living wage, they're going to be able to live near my factory. They're going to buy a nice house. They're going to then put money into taxes. Other stores are going to crop up. And what you're going to see is an overwhelming influx of money into the community. I'm making a profit. I'm sharing the wealth with my workers. They are in turn buying things in the local store. Eventually, the, uh, we can have nice schools. Uh, you're going to have shopping centers. It's, it's just a great way to, to help build a community. Wonderful. I'm going to keep this going. I'm going to keep making a profit. I'll make sure that the bank is paid. And guess what? I'm going to have to pay taxes. So the government is going to get some of my money, but that's okay because the government provides a, uh, roads for me. The government helps to provide a legal system that I use. The government helps uh, with infrastructure, all sorts of neat stuff. So I'm happy with it. I'm even happy to pay property taxes to keep the schools awesome. So that, my friends, is the American dream because every single person wins except my competition. They're making crappy bikes, right? No worries. And that is a very positive aspect of capitalism. And the reason that it works is me. I'm what makes it work. The reason I say that is because decisions that I make can change capitalism, right? That was basically trickle-down economics. The idea that if wealth is up here, it will eventually trickle down to other people. And it works. It does. If you do it the way that I did it, it certainly works beautifully. The problem is that's not always the case. A couple of things can rear their ugly heads. Uh, usually it's greed. Let's say I want to be a jerk. What I do is I'm going to create the same company, but what I'm going to do is I just won't pay my workers as much because I don't really care. I'll just rehire new ones because I'm making a ton of money. What that does is it doesn't give my workers a sense of belonging. They're not going to work as hard. They're not going to be as happy. If I don't give them things like health care, they might be sick and then they'll make my other workers sick, and they just won't be happy. It's also not going to help the community as much. However, I can still amass unbelievable profits. It's short term. Another big issue is if I have to worry about my stockholders, and if my stockholders aren't willing to hold on to my stock for a long period of time, they need money now. they got to see that I'm making a profit, I may not be interested in 10 years down the road. I'm going to be interested in just this quarter. And so I have to be careful not to spend too much on research and development. I can't spend too much on my workers. I can't spend too much on a health care or pensions or anything like that because I'm short-sighted or I'm greedy. And if a person is short-sighted or greedy, what you don't get is that big boon to the entire community. But I can in turn make incredible profits. And so there is a give and take there. What has happened historically to mitigate the second story, not the good guy, but the bad guy, is occasionally government steps in with reasonable regulations. Or government steps in with enticements and says, hey, business owner, we'll give you a little bit of a tax break if you hire Americans, or you don't send your jobs overseas, or something to that effect. And, and that can be effective. Uh, if you want a person to do something, strangely enough, it's better to give them an incentive, and that goes all the way back to Adam Smith. So maybe the government needs to think, rather than 
oh, we're going to tax you heavily or you're going to get a fine, maybe we might consider more incentives to try to make people a little bit less greedy and more willing to share profits. Now, I'm not talking about sharing the wealth or anything like that. I'm just talking about creating a factory that's awesome and the people that help you create something that's awesome, maybe they deserve a little bit of the benefits as well. If more people think like that, more people will be successful and that makes capitalism work a lot better. Hey guys, thank you for listening. I hope you guys are staying safe. I hope you guys are staying healthy. Uh, in the near future, we'll talk about things like communism. We'll talk about things like socialism. Uh, but just so you know, I have a tendency to like capitalism. All right. Take care, friends. Thank you very much.